This is the Google Pixel 9 Pro XL, and I've been fortunate enough to use it for just over a week. Big shout out to Google for sending this over for review without any obligations. So Pixels have been a beloved Android device for quite some time, but for some reason, this launch just felt a little bit different. So if you wanted to, you can already order the Pixel 9 and 9 Pro XL with the Pixel 9 Pro and Pixel 9 Pro Fold coming at a later date this fall, but even non-Pixel users seem to be stoked. I've seen a lot of people on threads and Twitter saying that they're so tempted to make the switch, and honestly, I can't even blame them because after seeing that keynote, there were so many cool features that they announced, and I too was extremely excited to get my hands on this device. And recently, I took the 9 Pro XL out for a day in the life to see how it would hold up over a 15-hour day in the city, so you might wanna make sure you get subscribed to see that. So let's start with the new updated design. Overall, the design of the Pixels has always been appealing to me, but this has to be the best looking one to date. And actually, before we dive in too far, one huge disclaimer for those of you buying this phone, the SIM tray is now on the bottom of the phone, so make sure to use the SIM ejector tool on the SIM tray and not the microphone that's right beside it. And despite me saying that, I guarantee one of you will still do it. But anyway, this year, as you've probably seen, they've changed the camera bar on the phone so it doesn't extend the full width of the back of the device. It now has these nice, sleek, curved edges, and honestly, I think it just makes the phone look a lot more premium. And a lot of you will be happy to know that even with this design change, it still sits flat on a table. And speaking of flat, we've got these new flat rails all around the side of the phone with a nice glossy finish. And it's got a lot of people saying that, especially with the antenna bands, it's looking very similar to the S24 and the iPhone. And honestly, I don't disagree, but the glossy finish with the soft touch matte glass on the back just looks amazing to me. Also new this year in terms of design is the addition Pro size. So we've got the Pixel 9 Pro XL, which is actually the same size, 6.8 inches, as last year's Pixel 8 Pro. And we have the new size on the Pixel 9 Pro, which matches the 6.2 inches of the Pixel 8 or Pixel 9. So Google finally realized that just because people want an additional camera and maybe some more Pro features, it doesn't necessarily mean that they want a larger phone. So as far as the display goes, on the Pixel 9 Pro XL, we're still rocking that 6.8 super actual display. And if last year's 2400 nits of brightness wasn't enough, Enough, then you'll be happy to know that this year's device has a peak brightness of 3000 nits. I took this phone out for a day in the life in the city and I was extremely impressed at just how well this screen showed up even in the brightest of conditions. I always hate doing that thing where you're constantly raising your sunglasses to see the display but with this phone there's none of that. <laughs> But yeah, overall, I've been pretty impressed with this display as a whole when it comes to gaming and just watching content. It's an LTPO OLED display capable of 120 hertz, again, rocking the Corning Gorilla Glass Victus 2. And while I haven't noticed any deep scratches on my display yet, it didn't take long to notice a ton of scratches on my Pixel 8 Pro last year, which if I'm not mistaken, is running the exact same glass. So I'd still highly recommend picking up a screen protector for just a little bit of extra peace of mind because this Victus isn't all it's cracked up to be. I, I had to, I'm sorry. <laughs> While we're on the topic, the fingerprint sensor this year is blazing fast because it's now ultrasonic. Pixels have had bad fingerprint readers ever since moving them from the back to the front of the display. So even with the screen protector on, this is gonna be worlds faster than what you're used to on your previous Pixels. So let's jump into the specs. This year's pros ship with Android 14 and under the hood, we've got 16 gigs of RAM with the option of 128, 256, 512, or one terabyte of storage. In my opinion, going for 128 gigs of storage in 2024 is absolutely crazy, but if you know that you're gonna buy the Google AI premium subscription, then that nets you two terabytes of cloud storage, so in that sense, it's okay. You do get a free one-year trial with the device, but after that one year is up, the price is steep. Like I'm talking $26.99 a month if you live in Canada. But we'll talk more about all the AI stuff later. It's also rocking their all new Tensor G4 processor, which again, we'll talk about later, and the Titan M2 security chip. Now, obviously with Pixel, the camera capabilities are always a highlight and this year's no different. And, and the selfie camera is finally fixed, but we'll talk about the back cameras first. So on the Pixel 9 Pro XL, we've got a 50 megapixel wide at f1.8, a 48 megapixel telephoto at f2.8, and a 48 megapixel ultra wide also at f1.8. These are some very good shooters. I'm usually the type of person to take photos and immediately jump into Lightroom to start making adjustments. But when it comes to this year's photos, you can very often get away with the images straight out of camera. And there's enough AI and other things going on to make all the adjustments and tweaks that you need without having to go to a third party app. I've especially been enjoying the zoom range, which goes up to 30X. But I think at this point, most manufacturers are realizing that 5X is pretty much the sweet spot for everybody. I also think that they did a much better job with the video quality as well. There was something off about the Pixel 8 Pro's video that just felt a little over-processed or over-stabilized for me. Now, as I was saying, the front camera is where we see a ton of improvements. I mean, last year, I think the front camera was like 11 megapixels. Hang on, I'm gonna quickly look it up. Yeah, 10.5 megapixels last year, like <laughs> what? So this year on the Pixel 9 Pro XL, it's rocking a 42 megapixel front camera with autofocus. So as you can see here, it catches everything 
pretty nicely. I mean, can't really complain. Last year, I used to try to film myself with the back cameras all the time and just pray that I was in the frame. So it's nice to have a good working front camera that you can rely on and know that the quality drop off is not going to be significant. Oh, and one important spec before I forget is that the battery is now a 5060 milliamp hour battery and Google is promising up to 100 hours of battery life if you enable the extreme battery saver mode. Obviously, you're not gonna wanna run around with that thing on extreme battery saver all day because it turns off a lot of processes in the background. But even just to run the regular battery saver, I'm imagining that you're probably gonna get an easy two days plus of battery life out of this phone. The fact that they're promising over four days of battery life in an emergency, four days of battery life is absolutely insane. And I'm gonna be testing that out. So that's another thing that you need to make sure to subscribe for because that's coming down the pipe in the very near future. All right, so let's talk a little bit about that Tensor G4 chip and its performance. So when it comes to everyday use of smartphones, there's always that big debate going on about which phone has which chip. And for whatever reason, phone culture has evolved to this place where people spend less time worrying about how the phone actually functions on a day-to-day -day and more time worrying about benchmark scores. So there's already been lots of videos and articles about how the Tensor G4 scores lower in benchmarks for both single and multi-thread than the 2020 iPhone 12 Pro. Because what's the expectation? A phone that is four years newer should be able to blow all the other old phones out of the water. But the question remains, do benchmark scores actually reflect how the phone operates on a day-to-day -day from a user perspective? Because I'm willing to honestly bet that someone who doesn't care or someone who doesn't even know that benchmark scores exist wouldn't be able to perceive any difference in their daily life. And a lot of these tests are so useless, like you've got people making videos where they have an iPhone next to an Android and they're opening Instagram at the exact same time in super slow motion and trying to determine which phone is faster at booting up the app and allowing you to start scrolling your feed first. And the fact that they have to slow the video down so much means that the difference is negligible, like it doesn't matter. But anyway, in my personal experience using this phone and even using last year's 8 Pro, which had an even slower chip, I never noticed any stuttering or any types of issues that hindered me from being able to enjoy my device on a daily basis. And quickly, just a tie into the performance, because I know some of you are gamers out there and you're going to be asking me, how does this phone hold up when it comes to gaming? So I don't play the most intense mobile games. Like the most intense thing that I play is probably Warzone. And even with that, I've never had any issues whatsoever. Aside from Warzone, I play Retro Bowl, Clash Royale, Baseball 9. So take that with a grain of salt, because if you play some crazy high end game, like I don't know how it's going to perform for you but for all those games that I just mentioned, I've not had a single issue. Now, finally, let's jump into Gemini AI because this is where Google spent the most time during the keynote. They announced some really, really cool features. And I think of all the companies doing it right now, they've been at the forefront of this AI thing when it comes to the user experience on a mobile device. So let's just hop into a couple of the features that they announced and how they actually work on a day to day. So in my opinion, still a lot of the stuff that was announced is kind of gimmicky, but there were three features that I think people are actually going to use in their day to day. Obviously, the biggest one here is going to be Gemini and more specifically Gemini Live. So to give you a live example of what that looks like, I'll show you right here. Hey, Gemini, I'm currently recording a YouTube video and I just want to know, like, what would be the best way to capture somebody's attention in the first 15 seconds? YouTuber, huh? Well, there are a few classic tricks to hook your audience right at the start. You could try shocking them with something unexpected, like a crazy statistic or a funny outtake. Or try going the other direction and be super mysterious. Ask a thought-provoking question that makes them want to stick around for the answer. It also depends on what kind of video you're making. If it's something like a vlog, diving right into the action with a high energy anecdote is a solid bet. But what if it's so a topic kind of that's kind of boring, like maybe something like a, a math related video? Even if the topic's a bit dry, you can still make a killer intro. How about teasing a mind-blowing math trick or a super easy shortcut that'll make their homework a breeze? Or you could start with a relatable struggle like, ever had that what even is math moment? Then zoom into your video's hook. Do you think it would be more engaging if I did it like visually, so actually writing something down or just me talking? Both have their strengths for sure. Writing things down, maybe on a dry erase board or some colorful paper, lets you show your work step by step, which is great for explaining tricky concepts. On the other hand, talking directly to the camera lets you add personality and make connections with your audience. So maybe try a mix of the two. Start by grabbing attention with your voice, then switch to writing things out when you need to dive into the nitty gritty of a problem. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. I'll try that. Sounds good. Let me know if you need more specific advice for your math themed video. 
So as you can see, it's actually really, really cool. You can have a legitimate conversation. Uh, even if you're in the middle of speaking and you have a different thought come up, you can stop mid sentence and express that thought and it immediately adjusts with you. Like it's a really, really cool feature. And I think it's going to have a ton of applications right now. It is kind of limited and the performance is very hit or miss. So for example, typically I can't get that far in a conversation. Usually what ends up happening is that his voice cuts out because I think it picks up a sound in the room and thinks that I'm trying to respond. Talk to a medical professional. Yeah, I'm ready to get started. All right. I See, so politely, he just stops talking, but you're still able to go into the log of the conversation and it will show you everything that he was about to say in response. And then you can just hit the little speaker button and he'll speak it out to you and you can continue the conversation that way. And so one really cool thing that I did with Gemini AI was that I used it as a personal trainer to see if it could run me through a 30 minute workout. And it actually did a very good job, put me through a workout. I had a nice pump going on, like it was awesome. So Gemini Live is definitely just as good as what they explained on stage and definitely something that you should try out when you get your phone. Now, the second feature that uses AI that people will honestly use is the new screenshot app, which I think is gonna be exclusive to Pixel. So when this was announced, a lot of iPhone users were saying, well, look, my phone's been able to do this since blah, blah, blah or there's other Android phones that have been able to do this since blah, blah, blah. And yes, but not the same way that the screenshot app works. So if I jump into my iPhone right now and I just go to my photo gallery, I can search up the term shoes, for example, and it's gonna do its best to identify all the shoes that are in my gallery and pull up those relevant photos. What this does differently, what the screenshot app does differently is that it analyzes all the data in a screenshot that you take and then it pulls it all out as well and puts it into text, which means that everything in that image is searchable. So here's another easy example. This is a running shoe that I was planning to buy. It was recommended to me by Jayhawk, Johnny Hockstetler. So I looked it up, I took a screenshot. You can see the size, the price, all that stuff here, all the info in the screenshot. When you scroll down, you can see that all of that information has been pulled out of the screenshot and put into text. I have the ability of just clicking on the Chrome button and it'll automatically take me to the website so that I can purchase the shoe. Or if I, for whatever reason, had too many screenshots in my little screenshot roll here, I could type in the search term, let's say 179, because all I could remember is that the shoe price was 179 and it brings up just that screenshot. Or even better, I use the search term price of shoe and then as you can see here, it pulls up the screenshot as well and then in plain language explains to me up here that the Nike men's Air Zoom Pegasus 41 running shoes cost $179.99. So imagine you've been using this phone for three months, a year, five years, whatever the case is, and now you've got a ton of screenshots in your camera roll and you're trying to find that one thing, a gift idea, or a used car that you were looking up, whatever. You're able to quickly parse through all that information and get something that is immediately usable back to you. This is a very, very cool feature and one that I've been using a lot. And the last one is kind of silly, but extremely practical and it's the add me feature. So we've all been in that situation where you're in a group setting, maybe you're at dinner or something, everybody's about to leave and you say, hey, let's take a group photo. So everybody lines up, you end up being the camera person. So you take your little picture and then you realize, man, I'm not in the picture. Like. I want it to be a group photo with all of us, right? And then what happens? Someone says, oh, don't worry, I'll take a picture for you. So you and that friend swap, and now you've got two separate photos with one person missing in each of them. So with the Add Me feature, it uses AR and AI. It allows you to take a photo, it frames it for you, no tripod necessary. Then when that one friend comes out to take the picture, it keeps everybody in place on your screen and you can line it up perfectly your friend can direct you where to pose and then they just snap the shot and it automatically stitches everything together and you end up with the perfect photo that has everybody in it. And I've used this feature a couple of times so you can see here I am posing by myself. And here's my buddy Tosif. You guys have probably seen his YouTube channel, Tosif Hussein. There he is posing by himself. And then the add me feature stitches us both together. Our shadows are both still there. Like everything looks very realistic. And there's so many other Gemini AI features. Like I'm going to have to make a completely separate video of just Gemini AI stuff because this review is getting very long. So again, if that's something that you're into, something that you want to see, drop a comment down below, get yourself subscribed, and I'll make sure to get that video out for you guys.
guys as quickly as possible. So let's jump into the negatives and determine should you actually buy a Pixel 9 XL Pro or should you just buy a regular Pixel 9? So as I mentioned before, the whole Gemini thing was what they spoke about the most at the keynote for good reason. There's a lot of cool features that come out. They're always trying to bring out things that are actually practically useful when it comes to AI, not just stupid you know, meme generators and dumb stuff like that. Like there's a lot of features that I think as we move forward, they're going to be very useful features. One major negative, one thing that I really can't understand about this phone launch, if you buy a pro device, so you buy the Pixel 9 Pro or the Pixel 9 Pro XL, you get one free year of the Gemini AI advanced subscription. So it's a value of, I think like $240 US, if I'm not mistaken, $320 or something like that Canadian which is great, it's fantastic. Once that subscription is done though, like I said, you are paying $20 a month in the US and $26 a month in Canada. When you buy the regular device, you do not get that free subscription, that free one year trial of the advanced Gemini AI stuff for whatever reason. And I don't get it because like I said, it's $240 US per year to subscribe to the Gemini AI. And then when you look at the difference in price between the Pixel 9 Pro XL and the regular Pixel 9, I think it's like $200. So in my opinion, you should still get like three months free or four months free, whatever it is. You should still get something, right? Like at the end of the day, I feel like you should still get something because you're investing in a Pixel, you're investing in everything that they're doing. And so I feel that people should be able to get a legitimate trial of these things. Like one month, in my opinion, is just not enough. But is it worth $26 a month Canadian for me? Like, I don't know that after this year is done that I'd want to be shelling out that money knowing that the price is only going to go up. But then on the opposite side of the coin, when I was using the Gemini AI as a personal trainer, then it's like, well, there are some applications where somebody might want to pay that because how much does it cost per month to go to the gym and have a trainer run you through the exact same things? Yes, the AI can't spot you on a bench press, but it's giving you an entire workout plan for whatever body parts you want to do, for whatever setups or splits you want to do. So then at that point, it's like, okay, maybe it is worth that price, but something like that doesn't apply to everybody. But in terms of negatives for the device itself, like I don't really have that many. I think so far what I've seen in using the Pixel 9 Pro XL for the past week, I've been very impressed. I'm worried about the durability, but again, that could be a me problem. Like I'm just curious to know how these rails are going to hold up the glossy rails. I don't want to put a case on this thing. The only time that I put a case on it is when I'm in my truck because I use an, a MagSafe phone mount in the cabin. That's the only time that I really case this phone because otherwise it just feels so good in my hands. Like I just love the way that it feels. I love the balance. It's just a very premium looking and premium feeling phone. So I, I just question how that durability piece is going to be. Another negative that I forgot to mention and just realized now as I'm editing this video is that the speakers on the Google Pixel 9 Pro XL aren't that good. I know most of you are going to be using earbuds, a Bluetooth speaker, or over-the-ear headphones when you're listening to your music, but the odd times that you have to listen to something through just those phone speakers, you're probably going to be a bit underwhelmed. So keep that in mind if you're grabbing this phone. The review ended up being a little bit longer than I wanted it to be, so I'm going to definitely be doing some follow-up videos for a bunch of the other stuff that I didn't get a chance to talk about in this first primary review. It's only been a week. And as I said at the beginning of the video, don't forget to look out for my day in the life with the Pixel 9 Pro XL downtown Toronto. It was about a 15 hour day. We did a lot of stuff with this phone, went a lot of places and pretty much ran this battery dry just to see how good it actually is. Be sure to get subscribed because that video is dropping in just a couple days. But yeah, man, that's pretty much it for me. Much love as always, throwing up two of them and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace.